What's up, everybody? It's Spencer Alessi, and this is the Esports Narrative. Hey, guys, this is episode 17, and today I'm talking with Eric Olson. Hey, Eric, how's it going? It's going well. Awesome. Welcome to uh, the Esports Narrative. I appreciate you coming on and sharing some time with us today. Yeah, no problem. Sounds like fun. Awesome. So uh, you are a freelance photographer and videographer. Um, You've done a ton of work. Um, I see just going through your Twitter a little bit. You've done some awesome work for Evo. I love the the pinned tweet that you have of that video of Evo. It's just really awesome. And you do some other stuff. Yeah, (laughs) you're welcome. You do some other stuff too. So I'd like to just start out um, and tell a little bit about your uh, narrative and, and what you're all about and how you got into photography and, and doing esports photography would be cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I I do kind of a kind of a range of stuff now. Um, it started with Call of Duty, uh, and that was kind of the main focus. Um, which wasn't. I actually grew up loving Halo. That was my esport of choice. But I also played a little Call of Duty as well. Um, but it started actually back in 2014, um, and literally just through Twitter, there was videography was a a hobby of mine and I was working a full-time job at the time. Um, but I was looking to start a full-time videography business. And so at the time I was just kind of looking for any opportunity to do more of that. And I saw, um, UMG Chris, I don't know if you remember that guy. Um, he got kind of kicked out of the esports scene because of a bunch of shady stuff he did. But, uh, anyway, back in the day he worked for UMG. He was there. Uh, Uh um, what was he? I think he was like the CEO or something actually at the time. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he was just tweeting out that they were looking for some media help and I didn't really know what that meant, but I knew what I could do. So I, I emailed him and just let him know, you know, what I could do, which is like, I do do videography. I had done a couple of events, um, non esports events where I would film during the day and then like edit together some videos to be shown later that day. So it's like quick turnaround kind of stuff. Um, and so they, we essentially just kind of got in a Skype call and talked it over a little bit and they decided to fly me out to UMG Dallas, which was my first event for esports, um, in 2014. And then, from there, like they just, I, I was mostly kind of a camera guy that event. I did some filming and editing on the side and put together a couple things for them, and they ended up liking that. Um, and then they kind of just brought me onto their production team from there on out. And so every every event that they would run, they would send me out um, as well. And I transitioned from being a camera guy just to putting together all of those like little hype videos that you would see before the start of a broadcast or like before grand finals, um, that kind of stuff. That's what I would do for UMG. Also those, uh, the team cards that they kind of went kind of popular, kind of viral, uh, where it would be like, I don't know if you've seen those, but they're like the little, um, each individual player on a team would pop up and it'd be a little video of each one of them. Yep. So anyway, it's kind of funny to look back and see that that I did that all those years ago, and they I still see them pop up in memes today, which is pretty funny. But a lot of that <laughs> is credit to like those guys doing really funny stuff. Yeah. But um. No, I always, yeah. Oh, what were you saying? No, that's uh, that's really an interesting story and um, kind of a history of of where you came from. And yeah. I always like to ask my guests. Um, on the show, what esports means to them, or if you had to describe esports to someone, uh, how would you describe it? Well, esports to me, um, I, it's just kind of like it's still kind of crazy to me where it's come because I just you know I remember back in the day there was no esports; it was just we would just play video games with each other and we're just you know competitive with your friends and whatnot. And then when Xbox Live came out, it kind of felt like, holy crap, you play this all the time and there's always somebody better. Um, and I think that kind of like 
started to get me interested in the idea of competitive uh, video gaming and then seeing MLG do what they did with Halo, that's when I started to really fall in love with esports um, because I like, I like regular sports, but I've always, I, I've, it's always been like not the main thing for me. Like I, I grew up skateboarding and snowboarding. I liked those kind of things. Uh, but I really loved, honestly, I just loved video games ever since I was a kid. And so yeah. to see video games, specifically Halo, get the same kind of treatment that like the NFL was getting and stuff, I was like just totally into it. And uh, which is, you know, I didn't have a lot of friends that were into it, but just friends that I would play Halo with and whatnot who were yeah. who were into that. But mm-hmm. yeah, esports is just like, to me, it's just it's just fun to it's it's really fun to be at an event where people really love the game they're playing, mm. which isn't always the case. Yeah. Um, but when you see it and when you're there, uh, it's it's really evident that like people love the game and they're coming together to play it because they love it and trying to be the best at it because they love it, not necessarily because the money is there, because the popularity is there. So yeah. that's now, what it's you meant. Yeah. Now you mentioned Halo. Um, what do you? I don't know how closely you follow the Halo scene or HCS or anything, but I yeah. had the owner of Ambition Gamers on earlier in the week, and he mentioned that you know he was thinking that Halo Six is going to be really big um, for for the esports world. I'm curious to get your thoughts on where you see console games as a whole um, from your perspective on you know between Halo and Call of Duty, let's say where you see those fitting and if you see one becoming more popular than the other, or if you see call of duty be just becoming the, the dominant console game. I think that call of duty will always be the dominant, um, at least first person shooter wise. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that will always be the dominant, um, console game just because it's, it's such a household name and it has been for years. And so I I don't think that halo will ever, take it over in that sense. Um, I mean, there was a time like Halo 3, that was bigger than Call of Duty at the time, or at least it was neck and neck. And right. Call of Duty since just completely dominated it. But I think that's because it's available on all the platforms, and that's just something that you can't compete with um, if you're Halo, because it's Microsoft exclusive. But I would like to see Halo really kind of uh, move back towards... Um, being a more competitive game. Because Call of Duty, it's a bit more... I mean, there's definitely people who are really good at it, but at its core, it's still more of a casual game than um, Halo is. And, you know, you've kind of seen, like, with Halo 5, they moved back towards that competitive direction, uh, yeah. which was good to see. But I hope they just kind of lean more into that. And I think that... You know, I don't really know much about the... Halo 6 rumors, but I hope that they're seeing like, there's all these other um, uh, games out there that have gone back like to a full true to form old style. Like if you see like the new Sonic game that came out recently. Right. Yep. It's like a, it's basically a remake just with new levels and whatnot. And I know that's not like a real good example, but honestly, if they came out with Halo 6 and it was like, exactly like halo three but new maps and and whatnot people would go crazy for it i think everybody would love it yeah and i actually uh i heard a rumor that uh, and i don't know how true this is so take this with a grain of salt but i heard that uh potentially halo could be um on you know on get away from console i don't know if that's truth or not you know to oh to sure see. um well and oh yeah it might open up I think you're definitely right there. I mean, it's already on PC um, in some form. Like, you can do Forge, I think. But I think you can also do um, matches on it as well. It's just I don't think they have matchmaking on it, though. Yeah. So that would be interesting if they they used PC as the – and push that in the competitive competitive sense. And then you're competing with things like CSGO – and you're kind of in a different category. That's true. Yeah. I I think the the road is already paved there for them. Um one of the, the game I'm currently addicted to that 
I play almost every night is Killer Instinct. Yeah. And that's available on Xbox, but it's also um, playable on PC through, mm-hmm. like, Windows 10 or whatever. So yeah. it's the same, and that's Microsoft Publishing as well. So that should, hopefully that, you know, it takes off for Halo as well. But yeah, that's interesting. they would need to do, like, a full release for it to really yeah. go big, I, I would think. Yeah, I, I think it would be a, a pretty big undertaking, but you never know. Who uh, yeah. who knows? Yeah, hopefully. I would love to get back into it. I've, I've honestly, like, I play Killer Instinct a lot, and fighting games has kind of taken root in me. Like, about a year ago, I, I, uh, uh-huh. I I've you know, I grew up liking fighting games like Mortal Kombat, Killer Instinct when I was a kid, but I kind of put that aside while I was playing Halo and Call of Duty and, and first-person shooter games. But um, last year, let's see, last year PAX East, I was filming for Astro Gaming, um, and me. Do you know uh, Enrique Oz Enrique? No, I'm not familiar. Okay, he's their um, head of multimedia. Really great. Okay. Uh, photographer. He's like probably the first big photographer in esports. Um, nice. And then he. He got a full-time job at Astro, and he's been kind of working his way up the chain there. Anyway, we were filming together um, at PAX, and we would – they had – at their booth, they had a Killer Instinct station set up. And every day we would get to the venue, and before we started filming, we would just play like, you know, five games or something like that just to kind of mess around. And I was like, holy crap, this game is so much fun because I could just – you can kind of mash buttons and still get some cool combos and, and whatnot. Yeah. I just realized that, you know, fighting games, I've always kind of thought they would be fun, but I never really gave them a chance. And so that little taste of it, like, kind of got me hooked. And so I, I went home and downloaded it after that. And I've been playing it, like, pretty much nightly ever since, which is kind of fun because now I'm actually getting a lot more um, fighting game tournaments um, mm-hmm. as events to go film at, um, yeah. which is a lot of fun because it's really kind of like, I mean, they're, they're getting very big right now. Like you saw the Evo stuff yeah. um, on my website and whatnot, but uh, it still kind of has that like grassroots feel to it right now where everybody's just really yeah. passionate about their games. Like they're there, not necessarily for the money. They're there to just, try to be the best and just, and they have a good yeah. time too. It's really, it's a really fun thing to be a part of. I recommend anybody go check them out. Yeah. The fighting game community is super passionate and there's tons of ups and downs and swings and yeah. cheering and down, you know, there's a, a bunch of, uh, it's more hype than anything I've attended. Yeah. It's yeah. insane. And with that, I'm curious, uh, what's been, you know, with the good comes the bad. What's been one of the worst moments for you so far in esports? Oh, man, I've got – I guess I've got kind of a story. I don't really want to like uh, – well, I'll just kind of tell you what happened. So this is kind of a warning, I guess, to everybody that's working mm-hmm. freelance stuff, especially stuff where you're getting flown across the country to go do things. Right. you got to make sure that you like uh, – know who it is that's hiring you and that you like click with them and that they're legitimate. Essentially I last summer um, I got contacted by a company to go film um, this like land tournament kind of thing in Florida. And I was like, okay, that sounds great. So I I sent them my rate. Um, And you know, a lot of times if they can't, come up with my rate that's usually a a good sign that it probably wouldn't be a good relationship um anyways because sometimes if they're expecting really good quality but not you know don't have the budget to pay for it then oftentimes they uh i don't know they just are wanting to have you do much more than you they want their cake and they want to eat it too kind of exactly yeah like if you want good quality stuff you you have to actually pay for it um and it's not to say that, you know, it's bad to not be able to afford that, but you just have to be reasonable. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. they were they were fine with my rate. Um, the guy I was talking to was, was cool with that. He was like, you know, I've seen all this other stuff you've done. I really like it. 
I want to make this like four minute. I want to send you this event. Um, and he was going to be there too. And then film at this event and put together like, just like a four minute video on this. And I was like, that's perfect. That sounds great. Um, and actually went to flew out to the event, met with the guy. Um, and gosh, it was just like, he was just so, I, we just really did not click. He like was so scatterbrained and he like, he really wanted to be in control of like every minute detail. And like, he wanted to just kind of like dictate to me what exactly I'm doing here and there and here and there. And, and it was like, I, I don't mind like, like some input and like some direction on where he would like the video to go, you know, that kind of right. thing. But yep. it was like micromanaging just to the point yeah. of ridiculousness. Um, yeah. And like the, f- the first day uh, I'd filmed like probably eight, nine hours. And then like after those eight, nine hours, there was still more filming to be done. And I, the thing is like, I know what to film and I don't, I don't film every single moment of every game because I know like, Oh, it's only at the end of the game when they're actually going to like celebrate or when they're going to actually do something that will look good on camera. Otherwise you're just, right. you've got, you know, hours of them just sitting there doing nothing, which is just not going to work in a video, especially if you're right. trying to boil down a three day event into four minutes. Like you, you yeah. can't <laughs> record that much. And like the guy would literally pull me outside of this venue and essentially kind of like condescendingly tell me how ridiculous it was, how little I was filming. And like, and it was like, dude, I don't understand. Like you, you seen what I produce. Like, you know what Mm -hmm. you're looking for. You're looking for a four minute video. This is what I do. Like you, I, I've worked with all these other, uh, big name companies that, that understand that. And like, I filmed for nine hours today. Like, it's not like, it's not like I'm not filming enough. I'm filming way more than I need. But you want every moment to be filmed as if you were streaming it. It's like it was just ridiculous. And yeah. long story short, um, he wanted to control me on a level that was just completely uncomfortable. And and I said no, uh, sorry, I can't, I can't do this. Like we, sorry if this miscommunication was my fault, but I'm not comfortable with this. Yeah. Um, so what like, did you learn like, from that? Or not? Anyway, so. I had to fly home on my own dime and didn't get paid anything for that event. Uh, So it was like, it was just such an uncomfortable moment because I'm like across the country and I'm like literally quitting this job because this guy is just ridiculous. And it was like, yeah, just kind of like a really helpless feeling, you know? And it was like, wow, can I just not trust anybody in this industry? So that was kind of a really low moment. (laughs) Yeah, I'm curious, like, what your takeaway is from that experience or what, you know, somebody listening on could take away from that. Yeah, so I guess my my message to people coming up and people taking jobs and whatnot is just kind of try to vet, um, try to vet people out as much as you can or at least feel them out a little bit. Um, try to check out the companies and see, you know, if you've heard bad things from other people, take that into consideration. Um, I already kind of was a little sketched out by this company before taking the job, but I really didn't think it was going to be that much of a problem because I just, I never could have imagined like the way he would have, he was going to treat me. So I was like, I don't know, do the research, I guess, before taking a job and, and don't be in such a rush to take everything that you'll end up in a really bad situation. Yeah. You gotta, um, you gotta know your value and Make sure you know who you're getting in bed with because, yeah. um, like you just told, you can kind of get really burned. And, you know, luckily for you, it, you know, it didn't hurt your reputation at all. It was more reflective on just someone trying to micromanage your, your production. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's the trouble you can get into. I will say that the guy, I was worried that, honestly, I was going to get back and it was going to be all over Twitter. And, like, he was going to be bad-mouthing me and whatnot. But, and I was going to have to, like, defend myself online or whatever. But, he actually, I think he blocked me on Twitter, but 
he didn't post anything about it, didn't like make a deal, big deal about it or anything. So, you know, I guess yeah. respect in that sense, <laughs> at least sure. he didn't try to take it further than that. So, so. changing. Yeah. That's, that's a really good uh, lesson. And unfortunately I had to learn it that way, but it is a good message yeah. and a good lesson for, for it was a lesson. On. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now changing gears a little bit, um, what's been the biggest accomplishment for you so far? Something that you're super proud about so far in your career? Honestly, um, it's, it's kind of hard to say, but I will say my favorite thing I've, I've ever shot um, for esports was Evo uh, last year. It was, you know, it's in Mandalay Bay and I'm literally standing right at the stage as everything's going down and filming it all. And it was just kind of like a surreal moment. Like I got on, like my face got on ESPN a few times because it was being nice. broadcast on ESPN. Not like anything big, but just like, just to be filming all of that there, it was just kind of a, it was a really cool, really cool thing. I, I never thought that, just randomly reaching out to somebody on Twitter could lead to that moment where I'm there filming that. So that was probably my favorite event so far. Um, and that video I put together actually wasn't even, uh, it wasn't even a commissioned video. I just was like, I felt like I hadn't seen my footage used that much. Um, Cause essentially sometimes you, you film, and you're the one editing it and it's, you know, you're going to put it out that way. But sometimes you're just hired to film and the, the video just gets put like in storage essentially. And, and like companies will use it for promotion for the next year or whatever. Um, I didn't see it used very much. So I just kind of reached out to the guys that hired me and was like, Hey, uh, I'm probably just going to make a video for fun. Uh, that's kind of a teaser for Evo. Uh, you guys can do with it what you want if you if you would like to, uh, but I more or less kind of wanted to just make it for myself and just to show like, yeah. gosh, it was a really sweet event and and be ashamed to not have um, much of it be shown. So I, that's why I put that together. It was actually just a passion project for me. Yeah, um, I was hired to go to the event, but I I wasn't hired to make that video. Yeah, definitely. You definitely capture. I wasn't there, but it definitely looks like you you've captured the excitement and the energy and the hype of the event, which leads me to my next question, which is, why is esports so exciting right now? Like, what is it that's just? It seems like it's all over. You know, traditional media nowadays of investment this and esports that. Why do you think it's so exciting right now? It's. Um, I think the demographic that gets excited about esports, um I think that was always there. Uh like people like me who love video games, um that demographic was just kind of always there. And it's just now that um it's starting to really gain an extreme amount of popularity. Um and I think it's kind of like people are finding it uh i'm not putting this very well but essentially if people are finding a home for their entertainment like uh -huh. somebody who you know traditional sports like wasn't like the big deal for them didn't really call to them that didn't really excite them too much or couldn't be good at that kind of stuff you know um right. like i go to these the fighting game events, uh, you walk around those events and it is just such a crazy variety of people who, in all honesty, probably, probably a lot of them were not like mainstream in like high school or, or something like that, but they found a home in fighting games, um, or in video games in general. And like that whole community, that whole fan base. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of different esports. Uh, where like they not necessarily didn't necessarily like traditional sports didn't grab them as much as esports does. And it's more accessible. I think there's more of a feel of like, oh, I could do that. You know, maybe some people are more realistic and like, oh, I'm not going to put in the time to get that good, but I could. Uh, and I at least understand 
you know, what it would take to do that. And that kind of makes it a little bit more accessible than like yeah. the NFL or the NBA or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, I think the demographic was always there. It's just being tapped into now. Um, yeah. And I think we're going to see just an even bigger explosion as, you know, like yeah. Chipotle is sponsoring optic gaming and whatnot. I think the yeah. the lid's just being blown off of this thing right now. Yeah, the 18 to 34 demographic is just right now in this period of time is just uh, seems to be just a, a magical moment for video games and esports and yeah. um, just gaming in general. Now, I'm curious to transition a little bit about yeah. photography and videography and yeah, kind of capitalizing sure. on the excitement. So what, from a videographer or photographer standpoint, where are the opportunities or where can someone capitalize on the excitement of esports as a photographer or a videographer or somebody like that? I mean, the field is ripe right now. If you're, if you're just trying to get into it, um, Unfortunately, there's not much out there for established videographers and photographers that need to get, you know, X amount of dollars per event or or per um, booking. Uh, That pool is fairly low right now. I expect it will grow. um, But for those who are just getting into it and those who are um, have it more on a hobby kind of level or more of a part time kind of level, that field is is gigantic right now um, because all of these teams that are sending players to events and whatnot, all of them are looking for content. And I know there's some photographers that like essentially just say, Hey, I'm going to MLG Columbus or, or MLG Orlando or whatever. And they can get like a dozen teams to chip in a couple hundred bucks or whatever. Um, so that they can get photos and, and video and stuff like that. Um, mm. So for people who are looking to get into it, like it's, it's ripe right now. I think you could easily do it. Um, and then it becomes a point where you uh, will need to kind of hone your skills and make sure that you're good if you want to take it to the next level. Um, but then also the next level is going to require that more companies and more um events get bigger budgets for videographers and photographers, which I think that's coming, but it's still pretty low right now. That's kind of the, where I am at. Um, you know, I did, I did it like every UMG event for like two years, something like that until I kind of stopped doing, um, that many events. Uh, I think they're more focused on online stuff now. Um, and they're doing some events, but, um, it's not the same kind of – it's not as big of events as they were doing back in the day. Uh, but anyway, so I did that, and then, you know, I kind of – I've grown my business to the point where I have to get a certain amount of, you know, a certain amount of budget to to make an, right. an event work. Because I'm also – I'm doing a lot of weddings here. That's kind of my main um, mm-hmm. business, and um, and it's – you know, it has to be worth my while to go out to an event and whatnot. So, so that's where like, uh, now I'm trying to like bump into that next bracket of bigger events that have budget for, um, for that kind of stuff and for, uh, you know, bigger companies and whatnot. And I'm seeing some, I'm seeing some success there now. I think it's going to grow more in the future though. Um, I'm connected with some, with some production companies that run events and um, they're always tuned into, you know, is this event going to have a big enough budget to, to bring somebody like me along? Cause um, videography, if it's a smaller event, videography is kind of a surplus budget thing. And I understand that. Uh, so they're not going to like, you know, it's, they're not going to sacrifice stream quality for uh, a videographer or something like that. So, uh, but Anyway, back to your question, like if you're if you're an up and coming videographer, photographer, uh, there is tons of opportunity. And I think if you haven't been to one, you can just show up at an event, get some great photos and then send them to the right people. And you can you can end up getting to the next event for free or or getting paid for the next one. And there's tons and tons and tons of teams 
that are competing at land tournaments all over the country. Yeah. Like small, just land tournaments. I mean, if you want to break in, like, um, you know, one thing I would say is, you know, check out what's going on in your local area and just go take photos of these guys that are starting these, you know, these uh, quote unquote esports teams, you know, I'll call them or clans or, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever they call themselves, you know, take some pictures for them and send them to them and, you know, put them on, allow them to put them on their discord or something like that. And, you know, maybe you get in with someone and then, you know, it, you know, it happenstance, you know, maybe you take photos of some team that's really good at Rocket League and they're at some local tournament and then they get picked up by, you know, a big organization and you're the guy or the gal that took their photos and they're like, hey, do you want to take pictures that we're going to play on NBC or whatever the, the tournament, the RLCS? And it's like, and then you're, you know, taking some big time photos. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot like just getting those connections and you only really get those connections by going to stuff, going to events, yeah. going to this or that. Um, just sending people random emails or random tweets or whatever. Like there is some merit to that and it can be effective. Obviously I, that's how I got to my first event was through Twitter, mm. but sure. um, how I made all of my other connections was just through being at events and yeah. connecting with people at them. It's so funny. Uh, actually, after Evo um, in 2015, I no 2016. Yeah, after Evo last year, um, I was at the Red Bull after party, and I met a guy from Elgato, and we just like I I think we were talking to each other for maybe like 10 minutes, and you know, just kind of was like, yeah, you know, I'm a photographer or whatever, and. And they're like, oh, hey, yeah, we might need some product photography at some point. I'm like, yeah, you should definitely, you know, do that. And then, like, heard nothing uh, <laughs> nothing about it. And this is pretty typical. You know, like, you, you meet people and you talk about, like, what, what you could do. And then, like, yeah. sometimes things just don't happen and things just don't work out. But just, like, a couple weeks ago, he reached out to me. He was like, hey, yeah, so I think we should do some product photography. And now I'm doing some product <laughs> photography for Elgato. So nice. it's like just kind of those, but it's all comes from networking. It all comes yeah. from meeting people at events. Now yeah. it's, it is important that you have to be good too. Uh, Cause otherwise people aren't going to be, you know, they're yeah. going to check up on you, but you definitely yeah. have to talk to them too. Now this part of the show, I call the five question combo breaker. Yeah. It's uh, kind of like a lightning like round. It. It's yeah. <laughs> the first, first question is best advice someone has ever given you. Uh, oh, it's a good quote. And I, I think about it often. Uh, and the quote is narrow your focus or lose your effectiveness. Essentially just like if you're focusing on a ton of things, you're going to suck at them. But if you focus on one thing hard, you'll be really effective. Yeah. It's like photography. If if you're focused in on, on, on a specific object in the frame, then you're 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 highlighting or you're drawing attention to that whereas if you have the focus uh so everything is in focus i, I guess um then you know nothing is really highlighted right right what do you think the esports industry needs to continue to grow and be successful um what it needs to continue to grow is to listen to what the the fans or the communities want um, and be really transparent with them. Um, you, you see the difference between like Halo and Call of Duty right now. Um, mm -hmm. And I think Halo is picking up on it a little bit, but they seem really slow to pick up on that kind of stuff. But like you look at Adam, I never know how to say his last name, but from MLG, Apicella, yeah. Apicella, <laughs> something like that. Um, it's just super transparent with his community saying, you know, what's what's not going well what's what's going well and and just will be like lay it out there all on twitter even uh, mm -hmm. whereas you know old thinking was that you just kept that stuff off social media until it was completely official but yeah. that's just not where the community is at right now you have to be transparent you have to let people know that you're working on something um or that you at least see that something is a problem and so if esports yeah. is going to keep growing um people with the money make a lot of stupid decisions. And so if they are not 
transparent with that, then, you know, they could lose the community. Yeah. What's the best play you've ever seen or the most memorable moment for you in esports? The most memorable moment for me in esports, uh, it would have to be at Evo, um, Hungry Box beating Armada in uh, Super Smash, Smash Bros. Melee. Um, just because I was sitting right, I was standing right there filming the whole thing. And he, he came from, uh, okay, I think he came from, he must have, he came from Loser's Bracket and it was a double elimination. So he had to, um, he had to beat Armada in one set and then win a second set to win the whole thing. And it went like he was down by a ton. Um, and I don't even really watch melee much, but being right there, it was just insane. Um, but he was down by so much. It just seemed impossible and made it back the whole way to win it. And it was just, it was like an insanely cool moment. Um, yeah. and that's, that's kind of the power of esports Cause I don't even, I really don't even watch melee. Like I, I played smash brothers back in the day, but I don't even really watch it, but being there was just insane. Awesome. Share uh, a resource with uh, the podcast listeners, something that's been, you know, beneficial to you in your career, something that's uh, a tactical resource or something like that, uh, tangible that that would be beneficial for someone in their career, something that's been beneficial for you on uh, your journey. Uh, hmm. Uh, for me... I don't really know. I don't really know what to share exactly. I I research blogs on photography and videography daily. Like my whole yeah. um, bookmark bar on my uh, web browser is all photography and videography blogs, of which I check daily. Um, and that's kind of like so for me. The key to success has been to just know everything and to research everything. And when I was working a full-time job, I would, you know, at night I would be on blogs and looking up tutorials and figuring out how to do everything, how to see, how to make anything I could want in photos or video. And that's really kind of been, that's been the key to me getting good at my craft. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I don't know what exactly to no, link people. But yeah, I will no, say that... also, uh, I'm a resource too. Like, and I've said this on my Twitter that if anybody reaches out to me that has questions about videography or photography, I'll always go out of my way to, um, to give people advice and to help people out with stuff. Cause, um, something that I, this is something I'm passionate about. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very good advice. And, um, I'm sure that, uh, a lot of people have or will take you up on that because, you know, there's a lot of aspiring artists in the esports community and I'm sure, you know, they're looking to find their way and trying to get their feet wet too. Yeah. Definitely. What's one, what's one daily habit that's been the biggest factor for your success so far? Let's see daily habit. Uh, I mean, I did kind of talk about how I research daily. Um, mm -hmm. I guess or for is me, something, is there um, something else you do every day, you know, that that's not kind of like the learning part of it, but something else that you do every day? Like, do you take pictures every day and edit every day? Or, you know, what do you kind of do to keep your photography fresh outside of, you know, those blogs and websites that you frequent? Yeah. So for me, I guess it's not like, it's not something I would say is a daily thing, but anytime I take on a new um, event or a new video project or, or something that like that, that somebody's hiring me for. I'm always um, asking myself the question, like, how can I make this better than the last time I, I did this? Like I never want to be comfortable uh, and just plateau with my, with my quality level. Um, mm. And so I'm always asking myself, you know, what's the next step? How do I, outdo myself um because you know you can see like if you if you see a lot of like older videographers or photographers in whatever 
market you're at, a lot of times there's a plateau that like you can get comfortable and you're like, your stuff can just kind of like, even if the stuff is good, um, you can plateau and it's, it's easy and it's comfortable to just kind of keep doing what you're doing. But, um, I think in order to keep growing, in order to even just to stay the same, feel like you have to be outdoing yourself because there's always more people coming into the scene, always new ideas, new creativity out there. Um, so I, that's kind of one thing. It's just always questioning myself, just questioning, can I be doing better and, and how can I do better? Yeah, that's good advice. Um, and now uh, I'd just like to – one last question is I'd just share your perspective on kind of where you get inspiration from for your art. Do you look at other photographers or videographers? Do you find, you know, inspiration in different places? Or, you know, are you kind of just, you know, get inspiration by shooting, you know, what you shoot by yourself? Or, like, do you do you gain inspiration from other things? I get inspiration. Um, actually, I I, like... I don't like to watch a lot of what I'm currently doing. Like uh, if it's like weddings, like I I don't spend a lot of time watching wedding, other people's wedding videos uh, or video game stuff. Like I don't, I I don't spend a lot of time watching that kind of stuff um, simply because I don't want to start to copy what other people are doing. Um, I get a lot of my inspiration from, actually from movies and from like directors I really like and from, yeah. Um, yeah, mostly that kind of stuff. But that, all that said, like there are some photographers out there and some videographers out there who I really respect and, and everything I, that they touch, I definitely go out of my way to, to see, um, and get inspiration from that. But I do kind of feel like you do kind of have to, if you want to set yourself apart from others, it's like not helpful to focus on what others are doing, um, yeah. but to draw inspiration from somewhere else that, uh, you know, like all the esports videographers are doing it this way, but videographers in general or like directors are, are doing it a different way. Um, get your inspiration from like the best stuff out there. So yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's, no, that's good advice like, and it's, it's kind of going against the grain and, and kind of doing what people aren't doing, even if it's so, even if, you know, it's not seen as effective, like going the opposite direction makes you kind of stand out a little bit. Right. Exactly. And like, you want to stand out, you don't want to stand out for the wrong reasons, but sure. uh, I would say whatever your craft is, uh, if it's photography, find the best photographers out there, regardless of what they're doing. Oh, uh, right. and emulate that and, and look forward to that. Also, you just kind of got to, you got to kind of trust your own gut. If you're a good creative person, um, yeah, you can look at something and realize, Oh, I hate this. Even if it is popular, like, yeah, this sucks, <laughs> you know, even though <laughs> yeah. like the majority might like it, but the majority doesn't always, yeah, they don't always have their finger on the pulse of like where the direction is going or where creativity is, is going. Um, usually they just kind of see where it's at. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I just want to close out the show with you just share with uh, the listeners where they can engage with you online or um, where you interact with people. Yeah, for sure. Um, Biggest thing to do if you want to um, follow my work is follow me on Twitter uh, at Captain or sorry, at X Captain EO. Uh, My name is Eric Olson. So Captain EO has been my nickname growing up um so yeah. x captain eo <laughs> if somebody out there knows the actual at captain eo i would like that so somebody get that for me um <laughs> otherwise uh if you want to check out like my wedding stuff and kind of my my business in general olsen o-l-s-e-n dash media dot com is where i have all of that stuff also my esports stuff is on there as well so they can check that awesome. out yeah, I was looking at it before the before uh, we started recording, and uh, I really enjoy your work. Uh, like I said, I really enjoyed the Evo video that you put together. I think uh, you're definitely very, very talented in what you do. And for everyone listening on, definitely go check out Eric's work. And um, 
you know, consider if you're uh, somebody running a big tournament, uh, picking Eric up. And I know that uh, he'll provide you with some good work. And uh, just from uh, I used to do a little bit of photography on the side as kind of a hobby. And uh, so I can kind of appreciate the amount of work and effort that goes into creating those those stories through photo or video form and uh just um really enjoy your work and uh I, I thank you for coming on the show and sharing your esports narrative with me and and all the listeners oh much appreciated i had a good time awesome and with that i just want to remind everyone that if this all goes as planned this show is just the beginning Thank you, listeners. I really appreciate you. It would mean the world to me if you subscribed and shared the show. Your word of mouth is amazing.